before we get going, I want to thank the um, student assistants, my GAs from this semester. You can see them behind me in 750, Victor and Maddie, and Sarah, who's at home. So if you hear them, um, uh, that's who they are. We begin tonight with uh, Franz Castro, and I'm very excited to have her. And actually, we always also have, um, we'll have Elise Shoreland later, and uh, Elise, Franz, and Mona were our best election night executive producers ever. And uh, they were just terrific. So we have uh, the three of them in this reunion, which I didn't even realize. So Franz um, is a new mom and congratulations on your baby who's already six months old, I can't believe it. Uh, and um, her thesis doc was finding fathers about people who lost their fathers in World War II and grew up never knowing who they were. And Franz is from Normandy. Normandy. And so she grew up with the uh, ceremony um, every year. And it was a great, a great, great uh, piece. Most recently, she it, is the executive producer and director of High Score series on Netflix. And we're gonna show you the trailer. Video games afford you the opportunity to start over. In games, we all start at the exact same place to play together because we're all playing by the same rules. Long before the internet, a handful of visionaries reimagine the world. We felt that we were creating a world changing technology. I had no idea what to expect. Pac-Man is so cute. You wrote it. It's so cute. Pac-Man is so cute. Pac-Man is so cute. People no longer played video games. They played Nintendo. It all started when our hero Mario had a very strange dream. Having a fast console wasn't enough for Sega. They needed a new hit game. <laughs> You'd see kids screaming, Sega, Sega! If they woke up Nintendo. We have the biggest consumer electronics company on the planet. Coming after us? Awesome. It is a sick video game. Shame on people that produce that trash. <laughs> I made the worst game of all time. What we did back then was ahead of its time, but the time is now. Well, um, I watched the whole series and was fascinated by uh, the work you did and how you figured out how to visualize a story that is so digital. Um, so th let's start with um, conceptualizing a series. Mm -hmm. How did you go about, I mean, you had the history, I, I assume people did the research. And then how did you figure out what to go where and how many teams you needed and all of that? I mean, I think, you know, we started by looking at like the great characters. What are the great stories we can tell? We didn't want to do like a complete linear approach where it's just like a collection of games going one after the next. And um, Netflix actually also really wanted us to think about a narrative arc that would span across the episodes so that it would be um, kind of like binge worthy. And so we just look at great characters, great stories, and often they actually come from like less known characters. And then once we presented them to Netflix, got them approved, we decided that um, to be efficient with budget, we would share the filming by location. So I ended up going to Japan and doing all the Japanese stories. We hired another producer director that did the West Coast and another person did the East Coast. And then um, we had a pretty lean team um, with just like a few producer directors, some shooters. And then in post, we really relied heavily on two lead editors. And then the absolute beast of this series, and I don't know that I will ever do a series with animation again, but it was a lot of work. And then um, 
also having someone very strong when it comes to archives. So talk to us about your uh, visual thinking on this piece and what were the hardest parts and what were some of your solutions? I mean, it's funny because I ended up having to make a documentary series about video games and the one before was about the internet. So it was like, all right, <laughs> I am screwed. It's the last visual thing you can do ever. And um, on high score in particular, it was a lot about the past. So how do you make this cinematic? So it's not just going to be uh, sit down interviews cut with archive and so on and so on. So we looked at potential scenes and um, what inspired these people and what could we film with them? So for example, one of the Japanese um, creators of Street Fighter said that you really got inspired by locations. And so we went to film in a bathhouse because that's why there is a scene in the game that's about this. And I think, you know, it's really about stepping in the mind of these creators and video games are so visual themselves that we had to make sure the show would be colorful. And so we really thought about scenes. And then um, we also try to make sure that our animation, whenever they would come, wouldn't feel like wallpaper, but that they actually would have some sort of a pulse and emotions and that we always had transition shots getting us in and out. And um, yeah, trying to be as, as cinematic as we could be and also making sure the scenes are relevant with the story. I mean, for Sonic, we go into an attraction park and that's just because he mentioned that. And I think when, you know, I was speaking to the students and I'm sure they remember, but that's, that's what I think pre-production is key because all these scenes and this idea is just stem from our conversation with the characters before heading to the field. So just like, okay, tell me about your process. Tell me about how you get ideas. All right, let's think about a scene and, and how we can do it. Because that's not really like a verite type of documentary. So you had those in-depth conversations before you interviewed them? Yeah, I mean, we had quite a few. I mean, obviously with a Japanese character, it's different and, and we had some fixers, but um, yeah, we spoke to everybody at length and um, obviously had to get characters approved um, by Netflix as well before heading to the field. So we had to make sure that we really um, newer people and again going back to the budget you know we don't have that many days in the field you need to know your scene you need to know what you're filming not saying that you shouldn't you know leave room for authenticity and and whatever happens and captures a moment but um we really had to do a lot of thinking ahead and um speaking of netflix what was it like working for them what can you tell us yeah i mean Seriously, my experience was really positive with them. Um, I think that they see documentaries as a very creative form, which is great in a sense of um, they let us, you know, be um, free and experiment with graphics and, and also this recreation that we shot. And they were always really encouraging when we wanted to do things in a different way. Um, I think that the power that they have, and that is absolutely amazing, is that once you release a show with them, it goes to 180 plus country. And it's the first time that I worked on a series and got so many messages being like, wow, I watch your show, it's great. <laughs> um, I think it's also a lot of challenges in terms of you know making sure that you have a global appeal. And I think that was actually a key part in even selling the story. And I was able to say, you know, I'm, I'm French, didn't grow up always reading the same books, listening to the same music, but um, the games are pretty universal language. Um, I think that um, we also need to make sure that we secure everything in perpetuity everywhere, like forever. So it's a, it's a pretty legal nightmare, but um, we learned a lot on this. And um, Netflix also has quite a few rounds of notes, but it actually was fine and, and um, I very much enjoyed working with them actually. Great. I noticed that you had some very directed moments. Mm -hmm. Was that new for you to really um, work with the characters and move them around in a, <laughs> a more directed way than usual in a documentary? Totally. I mean, I think on that one, it really was pushed to the extreme just because 
We wanted to have fun. I mean, I think one thing that we had agreed on and with Netflix before we started was like, okay, it's a series that's nostalgic, but also really fun. Um, so sure, we put a wig on a character and made him reenact some things he've done before. It's the 80s and the 90s, it's super um, interesting. And yeah, I mean, as a director, it's, it's really fun to do that. It's also um, difficult because you want it to feel authentic. There's that fine balance about like, should it be authentic or completely over the top? So actually, it's great. I think all that matters is that you're very transparent with the viewer so that it's obvious you're doing something with your characters and you're not tricking them into believing it's happening now. Um, and um, it was super fun to just um, look for all these props. One thing that was very challenging was when we didn't have a character, we didn't have archives and we wanted to explain something and we just didn't have the visual. So what we decided to do was this kind of highly cinematic and stylized um, recreation, but we didn't want them to feel cheesy. So no actors, um, no like completely like decorated set. So what we did was a lot of close-ups and sequences that would remind you of like a memory. So for example, uh, putting a cartridge in your console and we would film like hours of this with like specific lenses that would look different. So yeah, it was a lot of um, creative thinking and thinking outside the box. And um, it's actually, I think it's, um, it's been a good challenge for us all, even if it's been difficult, but I've learned a lot for it. Well, thank you, Franz. So uh, please stay around because after I introduce everyone, we'll uh, open it up for questions. Uh, next up is Sharon Shaddock, who hosts a podcast series for Gimlet Media. And she's the producer and director of a new feature documentary, not out yet, called Picture of a Scientist. And we will show you the trailer. This genetics, this molecular biology, that was the answer to all the questions I'd ever had about everything. We were just trying to be scientists. We certainly didn't want to be seen as troublemakers. People said, what happens in the field stays in the field. It was bullying from day one. He would tell me women were altering the science on the ice for worse. What's gonna happen if I report him? What happens if I don't report him? It was getting really physical. I didn't tell anybody because who's gonna believe you? You know, nobody. Women are extraordinarily underrepresented in science. When you ask somebody, draw a picture of a scientist, it used to be all men. There's a playbook and it was written by men. And I always felt I didn't have the playbook. <laughs> you know, I'm just feeling my way through this game. You get used to being underestimated. You get used to being invisible. These are great scientists. How can they not believe this? Many of the women that I've spoken to have left. This is the leaky pipeline. They cannot say the evidence doesn't exist. So I thought, OK, I have to show them it's true. I wrote, there's a kind of systemic and invisible discrimination against women. Can we really afford to lose those top scientists? He just needs to look at the data. That's what he'd want us to do for his science. You cannot do everything on your own. You need enough of your allies to make something happen. I expected to fight alone. I didn't expect anybody else to fight with me. Together, we can do better. Let's move away from a culture of compliance and towards a culture of change. If you don't have women, you've lost half the best people. Look at the talent of these women. This is worth fighting for. Hi. <laughs> I'm having trouble. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm really, we're really proud of it, of the film. And it's been a weird year. You know, we were supposed to premiere at Tribeca and we had gotten the announcement that we were going to be in the festival. And then we were so excited. And then like within like, a, you know, then like, um, oh gosh, what was it? South by Southwest. And then, it, you know, it started like COVID started to happen and creep across the country. And we just had the sinking feeling that it wasn't going to premiere. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah. Oh, well. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's still going to be great. And you're yeah. still going to have a great um, premiere whenever that happens. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Sarah started, uh, I'm Sarah, Sharon started with us with her thesis documentary doing a science based story. It was on parasites, a user's guide. And she's a great animator and was then. And then moved to a personal documentary close to my heart from this day forward about her father and her mom and her family dynamics. How did you? go from there to coming back to science and doing this documentary yeah i mean it's it's interesting because it's like this is a science it's a film about scientists but it's it's just a very personal film um because it's about these women it's it's it follows a three you know three different scientists who've had these different struggles with gender um with harassment and with gender bias um and like they've all kind of coped with it and and like come out the other side in really incredible ways. And so it's, you know, I think like my background and my interest in the personal has always been there. And so I was really in this film, we decided to really focus on them. And like I was out in the field, Ian has um, my co-director, he has a couple of young kids. And so he was, we decided that he would be more in the edit um, and I would be more in the field. And we would both like work on both parts but that was sort of the breakdown and I really enjoyed I mean just being able to talk to women one-on-one -on -one about these things um it was really incredible and and just very yeah it was really personal for me because I'm also I have a science background and you know just and and I'm a woman who works <laughs> which so this is such a universal thing um so yeah it was it was um yeah, very similar in a way to working on a film about my family. <laughs> so like France, you had some visual challenges in making mm -hmm. some of uh, the stories come alive because it was in the past and uh, science doesn't necessarily have a lot of action videos to go with it. Um, so how, how, what were some <laughs> of the challenges and how did you solve them? That's that was the main one. It was like um, one of our stories is about a, a advisor who sexually harasses and and actually like assaults this woman. Um, and then there there are other stories where like this you know this person's whole career she's had all these little microaggressions kind of pile up over the years and she needed to prove basically she was she tried to go to her administrators and say hey i have half as much labs lab space as the rest of the senior men in my department and the administrators are like oh no no you don't <laughs> and she's like well that's easily proven and so she went around and measured you know with a tape measure um all of the lab space and so we just we had a lot of like great visual moments from the past and so we knew we wanted to bring those to life but we didn't want to do it in like a cheesy or like heavy-handed way um so that was our that was our challenge you know and so we we do sorry if i'm freezing i know my internet's not great um but we we tried to do kind of we called them like tasteful recreations because <laughs> we didn't want to call them reenactments <laughs> where we would we never had like a full human in the shot you know you, like maybe you'd have like a little bit of a hand or like you know a paper and somebody's writing but you never see like a full we didn't want to hire an actor you know mm -hmm. um so it's yeah so that's kind of our, our solution and we we also chose to in those past tense moments the frame rate is slightly different so it's like stylized, the frame rate is a little slower, like it's just, it just feels a little different than real life. And was that something you figured out with your animations that you've been doing? I know you did a little series of animated uh, stories. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, the, this was... This was kind of like well, what we did in the, with these stylized recreations. Those were those were just kind of trial and error. Like we did some test shoots, um, and then we landed on that frame rate as like working pretty well. Um, I did do the, I designed the animations for this film, and I I designed them kind of thinking about like old science textbooks, <laughs> like from the seventies or sixties, like that sort of era. Um, so I ordered a bunch of old textbooks offline and like used those as inspiration. Um, 
And one thing I noticed that was really interesting and, and kind of ties in with the whole theme of the movie is that in all of the older textbooks, all of the illustrations were of men. <laughs> and there, there just weren't any women scientists in these textbooks. And so we were like, oh, that's interesting not surprising. Um, so we decided actually to just use them as inspiration and then hire an illustrator to make all new illustrations of women scientists. <laughs> so what you see in the film is all original, but it's it's all kind of inspired by this era and this old look and feel, you know. And um, for for the alum, what do you, would you suggest when conceptualizing a story, you find some great animators at the beginning. Is this something that everybody should mm -hmm. be including? What do you think? It's a good question. I mean, I, I think if it's like, you know, if it's a really personal film and you don't need animation, I don't think you you should, you know, I don't think you have to feel like you need to use it, but um, I, at least for me, like if I'm thinking about some movie where I have some data or some maps or something that I need to show, I try to think about the feel of the, like what's the spirit of the film? Like, is it is it sort of scrappy and like handmade or is it more like elegant and neat? Um, and then I, I try to just like watch things online. And whenever I see something that I like, I try to file it away or like put it in a note, you know, on my computer or something. Just remember, I really like the animations from that thing, because then later you can say, well, who made that? Or like, can I, you know, can I try to find somebody similar or like use that as an example, like a style example, you know? That's such a great, great idea. So you've also been uh, exploring podcasting. Yes. <laughs> that move from video to audio. Yeah, well, that was like, it was sort of unintentional. So my friend Julie and I, for a few years, we've been obsessed with the satanic panic. I don't know, has any, do you know about the satanic panic, Marsha? Okay. From your, from your I, I read briefly about it and then I watched your trailer. Yeah, so it's, it's crazy, but basically in the 80s and 90s, um, there was this wave of people accusing um, daycare workers and neighbors and family members of um, abusing kids in satanic rituals and being members of satanic cults. Um, and what's crazy is that this happened a lot. There's like over a hundred people were convicted and sent to prison. Um, and so we, I, I had actually read a book um, a couple years ago called Remembering Satan by Lawrence Wright. He's a great uh, journalist. Right, right, right. And, um, and it's about one of these cases. And so I was looking into this um, with Julie and we actually found a kid who had accused his father of doing this to him and then sent his father to prison. His father spent um, eight years in prison. And it wasn't until the kid was an adult, like fairly recently that he realized that his father was innocent and he had been essentially brainwashed by these um, these therapists as a child into, into accusing, you know, because when you're questioned as a young kid and it's just, you can, <laughs> you know, they can sort of lead you astray. Um, so he's been trying to make amends and, and get his father off the, you know, like exonerated. Um, but that was really the basis of the, the series. And so we started out thinking, oh, this is an amazing docu-series, you know, film film series. And we went to Texas and we filmed for a week um, with, with the family and with some experts. Um, and then we tried to, we had an agent and we pitched it to, to several different places like Netflix. Um, and unfortunately, nobody wanted it. We were a little surprised by that. Um, but we ended up pivoting and pitching it to Gimlet. Um, which is the company based in New York. And they immediately were like, yes, that's a great idea. <laughs> um, and so they, they, we immediately started talking to them and they ended up wanting to, to hire us to make it and, and they let us host it. So wow. yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So it was kind of unexpected, but it's like, man, podcasting is a lot of fun. It was really cool. It was really fun to do. Um, and the series came out this year, right when COVID hit. Oh, that's good. Um, what is it like being an independent? You know, like jumping around. Yeah. <laughs> um, it can be. I I really like the independence, but it can be stressful. You know, because you you kind of like 
work really intensely on one project for like a year or a year and a half. And then kind of before it's even winding down, you have to be like, what's the next thing? You know, what is, what's my future project? Um, so yeah, it can be a little stressful, but I, I don't know. I just like being able to, to make these different, like different mediums. It's really fun to have the freedom, you know, right now, maybe later I'll, I'll want to settle in with one company. <laughs> Great, great. So we're going to come back to you at the end. So please stick around. Next, I'd like to introduce Elise Shoreland to you. She's a documentary director, producer on film series for HBO, CNN Films, FX, Epics. Yeah, she's a, uh, was with us in 2008. And her thesis was called Against the Tide about Maryland crab fishermen. And she did just a terrific job of uh, uh, bringing them out and their problems and the issues about the, about the environment. But what we're going to focus on today is um, not something that she directed for the New York Times, The Weekly or Bloomberg or Vice News, but a recent film called On the Trail. This is sort of uh, in the genre of in the back of the bus where journalists cover uh, presidential campaigns. And her focus was on women. Isn't that nice? We have a theme going here. So we're gonna show you the trailer. It can get a little hairy. See, here they come. There is nothing like the rush of covering a presidential campaign. We are CNN's eyes and ears on the ground. We need to stand by to be ready to go. For the embeds, you're on a campaign bus, you're at a rally, your life is not your own. We are in the thick of it right now. We get a front row seat to history. I can't imagine a closer front row seat than this. Everybody has a correspondent, even Donald Trump. Trump's the only president I've ever covered. When the president goes after the press. The fake news, these guys. The crowd join in. It's definitely hostile. You still have to do your job. I have no emotion, so it's perfect. <laughs> I'm like half kidding. People always ask, oh my God, you have kids. How do you do it? It's tough to be away from your kids, but in order to tell the story, you have to go to the story. Kyung and I work very well together. I don't think I would be as successful in my job without her. Jasmine knows the story and she's gonna speak her mind. People can think what they want about me because I'm still gonna get the job done and better than most of y'all. Sometimes I wake up and I forget where I am. <laughs> the coronavirus pandemic is changing everything. I am your president of law and order. We thought 2016 was crazy. It's stressful. I feel like I don't really breathe until the day is over. You also just feel like you have to say something because if you're not going to say it, then who is? What we have is a economic crisis, public health crisis, social crisis. This moment is unlike any other. The question of what kind of leader do I want has never been more real than right now. When I saw this, I thought this is perfect for Elise because she was such a great producer. She was totally organized, particularly as a line producer in the studio. You ask Elise to do something, it is already done. So, uh, and she always enjoyed, I think the rush and the uh, stimulus of uh, deadlines. Um, as I recall. Not that she's doing that that much anymore, but I, I just remember the buzz. Uh, so I wasn't surprised that you worked on this. And I crashed a feature documentary. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you get tired as you get older, I'm afraid. And you were the supervising producer on this. So what was your job? So my job was essentially to work closely. I was the number two on the project. So working closely with the executive producer um to do half editorial half shaping the film and half you know making the trains run so we had 
six months to make this 90 minute film start to finish. So, you know, chasing the primaries across the country and following these reporters, we had three teams going at any given time, often simultaneously. And so figuring out where they needed to be and how long they needed to be there and where people were going. And as you can imagine, it changed minute by minute. So um, it was a little bit of half editorial, half film and half um, just getting it made. <laughs> so you had five teams? We had three teams of producer, AP, and DP, and we would sort of shift them around the country where we needed them to be at any given time. Um, the idea is obviously one team could not have shot for three full months on their own. It would just would have been too much, but we needed to sort of be in everywhere at the same, at the same time, and that's how we made it work. How did you choose uh, your characters who to profile and I assumed that this was a CNN backed project. So you had total access if you stayed within CNN. That's right. Um, this was made in partnership with CNN Films. It was really their idea and they brought us on to do it. Um, we operated in a weird hybrid situation that I'm not sure has happened before where we were working within CNN, but in our own little production company. So we were still our own independent beast, but with the resources of CNN and with the CNN ID, um, but we edited at a post house. And so we kept most of it pretty separate. Um, but you asked how we selected our characters, which was very delicately because there are actually a lot of women at CNN and a lot of very good female reporters, um, both on camera and off camera. So we just did what we would normally do, which is talk to a lot of them. And you know what it came down to at the end was who's willing to share their life with us, right? And who was willing to be open. Um, I think a lot of reporters, rightfully so, were hesitant about putting their life out there for the public. I mean, CNN is a highly scrutinized media organization that somebody like Project Veritas has been trying to tap into for you know years. So um, these were the women who were captivating, willing to be open and, and just really were fun to be around. And was it easy to work with people who know what it is like to work with a camera and to be in front of it and behind it? These women, yes, they were um, very, understanding um they were really it was like having a conversation with them where you could just go to step you know three because they already knew what one and two were the disconnect was often um because we're doing a film it, it, we moved a little slower you know we weren't necessarily we were run and gun but run and gun and news and run and gun and documentary are two different things so um, we would sometimes have to be like, whoa, 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 we're not, we're not ready or hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I changed the lens, calm down. <laughs> but, uh, but I guess they, they spoke in nice sound bites and, uh, uh, they did, but that could be a challenge too, right? Because you want them to, you, you, we wanted to get to a point with them where they were willing to let down their guard and talk about what it meant to be objective or what it meant to have a different background. Um, the film was really hoping to explore something that these women would help us, would help illuminate for us, um, which is how your background as a human can make you a better reporter and that those two things don't have to operate um, independent of each other. I thought that theme came across very strong about the um, importance of diversity in a, a newsroom. So let's talk about the embeds. This was a new term for me. It's um, young people who devote their lives to the campaign and they schlep camera gear and one suitcase around with them uh, and they never go home. They just stay on the road with the candidate. And what, they were 25 to 27 years old? I, I think the oldest was like 30, 31. But yeah, they're in that sort of range where it's not their first job, but they're still sort of young enough 
to be able to upend their lives for three months, two right. years actually. Some of them were on the road for literally two years. Amazing. So they were so much fun to to be with, you know, and to see them running around was terrific. And I kept thinking, well, we were, we were just at the right point to be sure to teach all of you to shoot and edit. <laughs> because right. boy, were they shooting and editing. Oh yeah, and feeding every detail back to the network and like knowing everything about their candidate. And they, you know, it's a great crash course in becoming a real expert on one thing because you know everything about Kamala Harris or you know everything about Joe Biden or you know everything about um, whomever candidate you're chasing. And there is still young enough to not be <laughs> jaded or beaten down by the news you know, cycle, if you will. And so they're, they're very excited and um, they become really close with each other. One of the scenes that one of the gossipy parts of the film is that we couldn't get permission from the other networks uh -huh. to use their embeds in the film. So we lost a whole storyline about how the embeds really became family with each other, which would have been wonderful to explore, but you know, Fox News wasn't so eager to have their uh, embed be in a CNN documentary. So we lost it, fight, but yeah. Got it, got it. And then COVID hit. I thought you handled that really well in the editing. Yeah, well, the end of our film was originally going to be whoever the nominee is walking out at a convention stage, on a convention stage with their, um, with their family and um, and their vice president. And then our ending uh, was upended by coronavirus and we had to stop filming. And we had probably had two thirds of the film, three quarters, but not everything we needed. And we had to edit remotely. And we had, I just remember waking up one day in our, in our room that we all, all five of us shared in very tight quarters, my line producer, my executive producer and a CNN DP and just being like, oh no, we have to, we have to change everything. Like everything stops. Um, and then the protests happened and then this movement across America started to happen. And so just when we thought that COVID was our ending, we had a different ending. And then how do you, you know, it was a constant, the film was a constant exercise in um, looking through the news to see some sort of either universal truth or deeper meaning or better context. Um, because we knew we were making a film that would exist in a particular moment, but that you want people to be able to watch anytime. I mean, there's tons of great political films that uh, don't have to just be watched in that moment. Yeah, I think you, you did that really, really well. Were there any um, um, structural challenges? Oh, oh, by the way, did the correspondent get COVID or just a fever? She, well, she tested negative, but this is where like COVID becomes really squishy because right. it's like she had all the symptoms and she had been in contact. So it's kind of like, you know, she treated it like a positive as, as anybody yeah. would, but yeah. So what were the challenges in editing such a wide ranging story? I mean, you had the timeline of beginning to end. Yeah, we did. Although I think we restructured our ending or our beginning at least a couple times, but um, we had a lot of stuff. We had a lot of footage to wade through. Toby, the executive producer, and I watched every single moment of it. Um, we made note cards. We made we then made digital note cards. We moved stuff around. We killed whole scenes. Um, it was every day waking up because we had to do it on a short timeline. We had to wake up every day and sort of reevaluate like, is this the right scene? Is this moving the story forward? Are we killing things? Like we didn't have the luxury too much of, of we had some time, but not enough time that you would have wanted, but we did it every day. And did you learn something new from watching all that footage and putting this together? I've never actually covered a political campaign. So I, I was sort of taken by um, just, I mean, I sort of knew the amount of work that went into it, but I didn't fully appreciate it. Um, and I worked at CNN previously. So I had some sense of, of the, how the news comes together, but 
I, I didn't fully appreciate the embed relationships with each other. And I, I guess I also having considered myself a journalist for so long and a filmmaker, but a journalist also, I hadn't really grappled with the idea that your own background and your own perspective, like what that looks like and what, you know, this, we were, got lucky in some ways that the journalism world was ready to sort of talk about what objectivity means and what we think it means and this false sense of it. Um, so it was interesting for me to be a part of that discussion and, and sort of think about it in that way too. Well, Elise, thank you. And please stick around um, for the Q&A at the end. Our last alum is Run Zhu Yu. He's the director and producer of the documentary short, The Wives, and that evolved from his thesis doc, uh, Homo Wives, which was a, a great personal, well, it was a great documentary that he then per turned into a personal documentary. And I've just introduced the personal documentary form and class and students are really getting excited about it so, as a storytelling mode. So that's really fun for me that uh, people find their voice. But uh, what we're, I, I wanna know Runza about your the state of that project, but also about the growing NewsDoc Chinese Alumni Network. Because I know that Nanfu often gives a call out and gets all of you to spread out and work all over the country. And that Rongfei and Si Yi and Ruhan and uh, Ethan, well, Ethan's here, Jai Ling, you know, all of you, Shin, are, are there and yes. uh, that we have something of a reputation? Of course. Yeah, like, like right now, uh, uh, when I was in the mid, mid maybe uh, for a new project, uh, I'm saying I graduated from NYU, they said, oh, you NYU guys, we, we already have a rep, reputation here in China right now, thanks to Nanfu and uh, Rongfei and, uh, and also Mu Zijian. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, these three people are really, really important in the industry. So it helped the rest of us to more easy to get jobs. And so what are some of the things that you worked on together with uh, your alumni? Uh, actually, I think I have worked with most of the Chinese uh, alumni. Like uh, uh, right after I graduated from NYU, I came back to China when? Like 2016, I think. Uh, Ronfei started Arrow Factory, which is a, vid uh, a short documentary uh, like a channel for a very large news media. So uh, we worked together on the first three project, uh, like, like pilot, pilot, uh, pilot projects. So that's my first co cooperation with alumni. Then after that, let, let me have a look. That's a start point. So uh, with the help of uh, alumni, I knew uh, I started to know some well-known Chinese directors. From that, them, I got some more, more short, short documentaries going on. Uh, but the freelancing is not that easy in China, to be honest. Uh, in 2018, I, uh, it was a very tough year for me. For the first half of the year, uh, I didn't get enough project to, to be in independent. So I plan to looking for a full-time job. But at that time, Xin, Liu Xin recommended me to another documentary project which she works as an editor. So I become the co-director co for that feature documentary. From that point on, like things go, go, went very well. 
like right. uh, and uh, this year with the COVID, which impact China more, uh, much earlier from last year, I think in December, I, I saw that mm, life could not be easy for the first half of the year. But after the Chinese New Year, like in February, Nanfu asked me to help her with her project, which helped me through the, the tough, toughest time in China. Like in the, right now, it's, it's like uh, November. But after, I think after May, China, uh, the situation in China was much better. So uh, life start, started to, to be normal and the job is much easier. So um, you, you're directing and you're shooting now. Yes, and editing. And editing, wow. Yes. Um, we're, we're, Namfu asked us not to give any details of her new project, but I, I was um, fortunate to see some of it and I was very moved by certain footage and she said Runza shot that. So <laughs> I was just so proud of you, so proud of you. Um, it was a very still moment that you captured really beautifully. So yeah, I think it's from it's from what I learned at NYU and uh, also like the tutoring from the alumni with my own project or the other projects I uh, I worked on. Uh, I often like talk to C or Nan for. Uh, advice they will for example like some 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 moment are very hard to visualize i will talk to them they will give me some ideas how to do that wonderful and then there's ethan too who who did a beautiful thesis documentary about uh independent miners as i recall and uh, mm -hmm. his camera work was just spectacular. And he's been a, cam a DP since then, right? Uh, actually, I, I was not so familiar with Ethan. I just met him once or twice in New York. Right, right. Because he's living here, right? Yes. Right. Um, I think all of you uh, work independently now. So, uh any advice about that i'm currently accepting advice so if anybody has mm -hmm. what what i what? said i'm currently accepting advice <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've been working i think like at least for me it's like trying not to it like work comes in in waves for me you know and so it's like trying to be forgiving of those times when you're kind of like you know there's not a lot happening and it's covid and you're just walking around your bedroom and <laughs> and because you know that like again there'll be like a wave of creativity and opportunity you know there's a question related to this coming in the q a's and it's from alpha and he said, how difficult is it to get funds as an independent filmmaker to produce your document documentaries? Very. <laughs> and any yeah. tips? <laughs> Anyone want to take that? I think that's Sharon, that would be most uh, appropriate for you. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I was, yeah, I wrote back in the um, answer that like for my first film from this day forward, um, I, a lot of like the, I sort of focused on like smaller grants. My, it was a film about my parent who's transgender. And so I really, you try to like focus on like whatever the subject matter is and try to find um, organizations that cater to that. I found that I had a lot of success with those. And then, um, and I did, I did have to, like I, I tweaked the the pitch a lot. Like I had this, my first idea was like, oh, I'm gonna go around the country and talk to all these kids of transgender people. And it's gonna be this huge movie with all these different characters. 
And then um, from there, it just kind of got honed down and uh, to the point where it was like, oh, it's actually just a film about me and my family. <laughs> um, and so once that focus came in, you know, and that came from like friends and filmmakers who kind of weighed in and gave me advice. Um, and I just kept, you know, working on that. Um, and then that really helped once I had it in a place where I felt like uh, it was a better story, you know, and a better film. So just keep being persistent and, and believing in your project because really like if you give up, like don't give up because it will be made if you are persistent, <laughs> it will happen, you know, but if you give up, it's never gonna happen. Well, one of the, 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 the pros and the cons of um, knowing how to shoot and edit and equipment being more reasonably priced these days is that you can get it started on your own like you, Sharon, did with the um, uh, series project that turned into a podcast, but you still, yeah. and you have to be able to shoot a trailer, or at least some footage to show you have access and all of that. And I'm glad that um, you're saying that the proposal process is an important part of the process to refine yeah. your ideas. Because it's yeah. really onerous, but it's a, it's a good way to set it down. At least, did you have to write a proposal for um, on the trail? We didn't. Um, we had various levels of treatments that we had to sort of, we did a lot of writing. Um, when I did the weekly for the Times, as might be expected, but also was pretty much in line with, I think, most film proposals, we did an extensive amount of treatment writing, like rewrites and, and further writes before we even went out the door. So um, well, there were multiple layers to even getting that on the trail was pretty much commissioned, right? That's right. Yeah. And what about for you, Franz, with... Um... Yeah, you need to do a lot of writing. I mean, before even selling a series and, and I do like commission work. So meaning I've never put the founds or started anything before by myself. I don't think I've ever had the courage to do so. And I appreciate having a network giving me the funding. But I think, you know, when I was a student myself, I would dismiss writing a lot. And I'm so grateful that there is a writing class and learn so much through Cora because right now I'm developing another series and all I'm doing is writing. It's writing a pitch deck. It's um, making sure that um, the people who will read it can imagine your story, can visualize it. So I think every video work actually starts in word. So it's, it's crucial and very important. And then obviously there is all the writing that comes later when it comes to voiceover and, and all of that, but um, to just, start a series and, and I'm sure the same with a film, it's all about writing. Uh-huh. Um, let's see. Um, uh, we have another question from Goldana, who's a first semester uh, news doc student. And she said, what do you guys do every day that's super important for your job? Oh. And Drink it sounds like writing is one of those things. <laughs> I mean, I think watching a lot of other film, I think Sharon said it when she finds inspiration in um, other people's animation, it's the same. And, and not only watching, but reading. And um, whenever you see or read a story that you like, or ask yourself the question, like, why did I like it? Was it because of the characters? Was it because of the emotion? Was it the visuals? And Kind of trying to see you know um what makes it good but also if you didn't like something trying to be like whoa i don't want to do that and i sometimes almost learn more from things where i was just like oh i thought this didn't work and i want to make sure i i don't get there and do like make the same mistakes france what is um the la documentary scene like now that you've moved you've left us um, it's, um, I mean, I, I just arrived and obviously um, I was on maternity, but from my very beginning navigating this new world, um, and I was very scared about it because I think the 
documentary scene is a lot in New York with a lot of production companies being here and networks and execs more in LA. But um, I think it's kind of the same, except that there is always big names and big guys attached to project. And then you have to navigate that and it's just the way it is. So it's a lot about like who you are or which other films you've done, but it's just LA. <laughs> The weather is good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good way to get through the winter. <laughs> Runsa, has the taste, Chinese taste changed? Are documentaries more popular now? Uh, compared to when? Um, 10 years? Yeah. Except yeah, of course. Yeah. It changes a lot. A lot. Like uh, I forget forget when the film was uh, theatrically released. It's about uh, uh, the women who were raped uh, during the World War II the, by the Japanese soldiers. It was the highest uh, box office in documentary. It's like uh, zero point two billion Chinese yuan, which is imaginable for a documentary. And you can you can see more documentaries are being theatrically released. Before that, it's just like a, a screening in small venues, cafes, something like that. Right now, you can see it on big screen. Right. So, um, is and what is what are the 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 what's the content of the documentaries now because you have to play it safe right uh so it's more about uh, about family or about tech company companies so now mm, how do you say that politics we don't uh, yeah we don't involve that as uh, we can, as little as possible. I see, I see. Um, so you have to push the envelope here. Yes. It's non food us, yes. <laughs> right. Um, but I have to say that Chinese filmmakers have so much passion. Maybe it's because it's all pent up. Um, uh, but when Chinese students get here, wow, you know, they really let go. And we have quite a few Chinese uh, former students I see um, uh, here. Uh, do, you, do you guys have any questions or want to say anything about your experience now? Let's see, we have Meng Chen and Louise. Um, I turned your mics on if you want to add to what um, Runza has said. Alice, you can turn your mic on. Hi, Marsha. Hi, Runza. Hi, everyone. Who is this? Uh, Alice? Uh, this is Meng Chen. Oh, Meng Chen, oh. how are you doing? And are you back in China? <laughs> No, I'm still in New York. I'm in Brooklyn. It's cold today. <laughs> and and your thoughts about what Brunza was saying? Yeah, definitely. I feel like uh, Chinese like documentary has like the has been more and more popular for sure in the past years. And like there are more theatrical release. Like uh, and also as you mentioned, we have a lot of taboos we cannot touch on, but. I think Chinese filmmakers are really trying to like play within the limited space and to try to play as much creativity as we as they can. So it's like a really great, uh, both like uh, it's promising, but still like there are more rooms to explore. Right. Um, have you showed your film about your aunt? Uh, not yet. <laughs> uh -huh. I've shown with my like uh, people in the films and uh, in my, with my friends and family span out uh, to the public or somewhere. <laughs> I see, okay. Um, uh, Sarah, any other questions? Yes, we just got one from Kyla, who is a fellow third semester student. 
And she says, what is your advice for us who are graduating soon and trying to find work after school during <laughs> uncertain times? Reach out to alumni. I also feel like there are, I think, I forgot, maybe Francie said this, but there's a lot of development going on. So if there's somebody whose work that you really like and that you really admire, like don't be afraid to send them an email or find their production company um, and just shoot them a note and say, hi, like I am looking for XYZ because in even in navigating the freelance world, like you never know who's gonna be looking for help at any point in time. So just don't be afraid of doing that. And also don't be afraid of your own ideas. I wish somebody had told me that 15 years ago. <laughs> That's good advice. Um, I was gonna say if you, you know, try to network as much as you can, um, even though it's all virtual right now, like uh, I'm a member of a few different groups and we post jobs there. And a lot of people are looking for part-time help, like researchers, you know, writing, like a lot of people are in development right now on new ideas. So that's kind of a good place to, it really is a great way to get in if you wanna start working with like a, TV channel or like a production company or yeah. And learn After Effects and um, get your graphic abilities up because I think that's always, always in mm -hmm. demand. Um, <laughs> okay, so I think um, I'm going to wrap this up. I can't thank you guys enough, Sharon, Franz, Elise, and Runza for participating and I think that um, Sarah is making e e changing everyone's status. So can you turn your cameras on so we can take a photo of everybody who's here? And I think we can squeeze everybody on. I think I set, set that um, so it will work. Okay, we're getting there. Okay, hi, Yunbo. Good morning. Hey, Victor and Maddie, great. Hi. And while we're doing this, I wanna give a shout out to Sarah, Victor and Maddie for helping to make this go so smoothly. It was a little rough on Monday, but we really rehearsed. <laughs> and I, I uh, thank you, the three of you for working so hard. Emily, how 60 minutes or... That's a long story Sorry. that we don't have time for right now. <laughs> great, 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 great. Uh, we're almost all there. We're almost all there. Oh, Shimon, you stayed. Terrific. Cora, hi, Cora. Nice to see you. Okay, are we there? I think we're there. That's everyone. So, hi, everybody, everybody. <laughs> Sarah, are you gonna take our uh, the photo? Meredith, hi. Yes, I can take a photo. We are a big enough group that we span two pages today. So, oh, okay. Uh, Wait, I, I have a big enough shot, hold on. I think I can do one. Hold on, everybody. I know this is horrible. Um, And, oh, hold on. <laughs> What's a uh, screen? Uh, it's uh, command shift three. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I'm also going to take a photograph before everybody leaves. Marshawn, hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, you warm my heart that you're all here. Okay, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. See your family. Bye. It's great. Bye.